I, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, thank all the organizers for organ you know arranging this conference and inviting me here to give a talk. Um, so I'll change gears uh, quite a bit, uh, probably for a third time today, and uh, talk about uh, dark matter halos essentially, and uh, sort of thinking about the dark matter halo, the structure, the internal structure of the dark matter halo, and um, you know. Uh, with some new insights of you know, where the edge of the halo is, how we can uh, measure the halo, and what we can learn from these measurements of the halo going forward, right? So, uh, of course, a lot of this work has been done with uh, a lot of collaborators who, uh, who I've worked with actively, who have helped me think, so I should also a big, give a big shout out to all of them. So, uh, yeah, so over the past few days, we've had uh, several speakers and we, um, Talk about dark matter halo, and you know we all love, know and love dark matter by now. Uh, so today we think that the dark matter paradigm is uh, quite robust, right? Uh, starting from uh, Zwicky, and then in the 1970s, Leo Rubin, or Stryker and Peebles, uh, when the first uh, when we were first conceiving the idea of dark matter. Uh, following that time, following the decades after that time, uh, apart from the you know, we now have uh, evidence that a large fraction of the mass in the universe, uh, of the gravitational mass in the universe is in the form of uh, uh, matter that does not seem to emit any light uh, and is largely, uh, just largely interacts with other particles gravitationally, right? So we have uh, evidence for it from a widely, you know, we have evidence for it from many different uh, directions and in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, what is even more exciting that evidence from all these di directions to a large extent also agree with each other. So we have independent probes of dark matter uh, that seem to sort of be telling us the same story about how it behaves, what its relic abundance is and so on, right? So uh, a lot of the dark matter uh, that is there in the universe uh, exists uh, within dark matter halos, we, uh, essentially, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, over densities of dark matter that were there in the early universe, which have, which have grown with time gravitationally and collapsed to form sort of self-bound, uh, often virialized structures uh, that essentially harbor all the stars, the galaxies, and all the visible matter that we see, right? Uh, so the, uh, the, the, in, the, in the cold dark matter par paradigm, we also think that uh, the, the, uh, the halos grow in a certain way where we have the smallest structures uh, collapsing first and also coming together and merging to form larger structures in the universe. So the smallest halos that we, uh, in a sense, can see contain sort of dwarf galaxies within them, uh, within their centers that again merge together to form Milky Way-like galaxies uh, that come to, uh, you know, which live in halos, which live in overall dark matter halos that are 10 to the 12 or so, uh, which again come together and then they, they can often be in larger, much larger, uh, bound in a much larger potential well uh, of, of something like a cluster halo, which can often go up to even 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 solar masses. Uh, so this standard picture is what we call the hierarchical structure formation. Of course, to the left of this diagram is, um, is, is we, we, in, the, in the cold dark matter paradigm, we can still form halos here, uh, but they, they just don't have enough, uh, the potential wells are in a sense not deep enough to hold, uh, you know, to cool the gas and hold the gas long enough to form stars. So we have uh, darker halos that, that is essentially exist in this part of the parameter space, which we can also try to track or find with, by their gravitational influence on other structures in the universe. Uh, so dark matter halos, uh, you know, in a sense can be, you can think of them as a probe. Uh, these, these you, the, you can think of them as units uh, that, that probe structure formation in, in many ways. So one of the things that we like evaluating in, 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 in the universe is what is the mass function of these dark matter halos? So what is the distribution of uh, halos at a given mass range? And we uh, basically, look at the mass function of objects. So the higher end of the mass function, which is you know, how many more of the most massive systems that we have in the universe is a strong probe of, uh, of, the, of the expansion of the universe, of the amount of dark energy content in the universe. 
whereas the lower mass end of the mass function, uh, which is essentially telling us what are the smallest uh, structures that we can form in the universe is, is a probe of what is the mass of the dark matter particle, what is sort of like the temperature of the dark matter, matter particle, and what are uh, the smallest uh, structures that it can condense into. Of course, we can also just look at the clustering of these objects uh, to get the overall uh, distribution of uh, perturbations in, in their densities. Uh, the, the power spectrum or uh, the matter power spectrum or the, you know, essentially the halo power spectrum uh, that is, of course, also sensitive to how the universe has evolved. And then, of course, we can look in, in the internal structure of dark matter halos, which are essentially uh, the densest regions of dark matter in the universe uh, to study, um, to, to basically probe whether they have uh, any kind of interactions uh, what is the microphysical nature of these objects and how they affect uh, basically the distribution of mass uh, inside of these objects. So they have been studied quite extensively uh, over the years uh, through n-body simulations and also, of course, uh, in, in, through observations. Um, so uh, it's, it's been found in simulations uh, that uh, dark matter halos, uh, the internal structure of these objects, uh, the density distribution is uh, close to uh, something that is called the NFW profile, which has uh, where the density, uh, which is shown on the y-axis and the radius on, on the x-axis, uh, going away from the center of the halo, where the uh, density distribution approaches a minus one uh, slope, a logarithmic slope of minus one in the inner region and minus three in the outer outskirts. Um, and largely, uh, you know, there have been deviations from uh, in, in both these regions, but it is seen that largely on average, it seems to follow something like uh, an NFW profile. Um, but uh, however, if you actually go and look at a dark matter halo, it's a very dynamical object, right? Uh, it's it's uh, every individual halo is, is uh, significantly unique. It's grown in, in, in a different environment. It has evolved. Uh, through time differently. And uh, overall, it's, it's quite a dynamical uh, object. And I think some of what I will motivate in this talk is to you know, go beyond just thinking of uh, the halo as an NFW uh, distribution uh, to you know, think of uh, how, how thinking of the halo as a dynamical system can help us uh, sort of extract sort of more understanding about, uh, about about the internal structure and what we can do with it. So one of the questions that has you know, been uh, sort of uh, nebulous is where exactly is the boundary of the halo? Is there even a boundary of the halo? What do we mean by a halo, right? Uh, and depending to who you talk to uh, and what they're interested in, uh, you, you know, the, the boundary of a halo can essentially range from, range a wide variety of scales within the halo. And essentially, uh, Essentially, you know, it's fine to use it depending on you understand what you need it for exactly. But in principle, these wide variety of scales uh, can probe uh, sort of different physical processes or different parts of the halo's evolution history uh, through time, right? So uh, one of the questions that I have been working on is, is to understand if there's some uh, sort of natural way of understanding uh, where the extent, the gravitational extent of the halo is, or if we can define anything uh, like a boundary of the halo. So actually, you know, it's, uh, if we think of the, if we look at the dark matter, so uh, while we usually define a boundary based on some overdensity, we call, uh, you know, we, we draw a circle at the radius where the overdensity inside the, den inside the uh, peak is some uh, integer times the, uh, the background density. But if you actually look at uh, the evolution of a halo, and I find it quite instructive to look at the phase space of diagram of halo evolution, um, there is actually a natural way uh, to divide up the region around the halo into, into one uh, that contains sort of virialized or multi-streaming matter and um, another region where you essentially just have things that, have, that are falling into the halo for the first time and have not actually started orbiting the internal potential. So just to give a, a quick review of this, uh, so on the 
so the phase space here is being defined as the um, radial velocity. Uh, so velocity with respect to the center of the halo on the y-axis and distance from the center of the halo on the uh, x-axis. So far away from the halo. Uh, so anything with positive velocity is moving out. Anything with negative velocity is falling in. So far away from the dark matter halo, uh, we just have things expanding away with the Hubble flow. As we move closer to the halo, uh, you know, we reach a region of zero velocity where things cut off from the Hubble flow and start to fall into uh, the potential well. Um, we move in uh, to different layers of particles uh, to smaller and smaller radius where the velocity becomes more and more negative until it essentially crosses over smoothly. Um, and it's just now crossed the center and moving in the other direction. So, it, uh, so then, the, uh, then particles are moving out, eventually out to a radius where it essentially sort of uh, turns around, reaches its upper center, turns around, or, you know, we call it flashes back in a sense, back to the halo's potential and orbit and does the same thing over and over again, right? So this uh, boundary, which is created by the most recently accreted material at, uh, at a given time, um, that is on its, uh, that it's near its first apocenter is essentially uh, separating out this region where we have infall, right? So things that are falling in for the first time uh, from this multi-streaming region where, you know, at a given, it's called multi-streaming because at a given radius, we have uh, shells of dark matter that are at different velocities, right? So different streams of dark matter are crossing each other. Um, and this is just essentially just the orbit of, of, of dark matter particle in, in a potential that is growing. So the orbits are shrinking because uh, the, the, uh, the size of the potential is growing due to mass infall. So this boundary essentially forms uh, a natural boundary that separates out different regions of the halo. So the density profile uh, is, is just the you know, integral along the uh, radial direction. And if you had, uh, smooth spherical accretion, uh, it, you know, people have studied this for a long time, you know, using self-similar solutions, et cetera. Uh, you, at every apocenter, you get the sharp caustic and the outermost caustic essentially just uh, divides out your region into an infall region and uh, an orbiting region. Uh, so if you deviate from spherical symmetry, you, you wash out the inner caustic but the jump at the, the, the phase space discontinuity uh, still stands out uh, even if you look at uh, elliptical objects. Uh, so that was in, you know, the figure that we were seeing here was idealized. Uh, but if you look in simulations uh, where uh, we try to uh, simulate uh, cosmological volumes where we have many different kinds of perturbations growing into present day dark matter halos, uh, it turns out that even when you, uh, when you at least select on mass and even stack these halos together, even though uh, all these halos have grown uh, in very different environments, uh, this feature of, of uh, really this, you know, the steepening of the density profile, the phase space discontinuity really stands out in, in, in uh, even when we look at uh, sort of ensemble averages of these objects, right? So uh, this was pointed out by Deemer and Kraftsoff in 2014, that the density profile of the halo, um, the slope of the density profile of the halo, uh, on top there's the density as a function of radius, and on the bottom there's the logarithmic slope as a function of radius, uh, becomes quite steep in a narrow localized region uh, around the traditionally defined virial radius. So this is what we would have expected from NFW, uh, whereas this is what we get uh, at least uh, in a large variety of halos. And uh, you can see uh, that the steepening corresponds exactly um, or very closely to where this phase phase discontinuity is happening. Um, so this is the stacked phase of VR versus R space. And uh, you see that this discontinuity uh, really imprints itself, uh, which is to be expected on the density profile of the uh, dark matter halo. And uh, right. So uh, this location um, is essentially what we, uh, so the location of the minimum is what we uh, call the splashback radius. So there's a minimum and then it goes back to the background density. So background where the halo is embedded in the cosmic web. So it goes back up to zero again. Um, 
And uh, what we primarily found is that the dark matter density profile, if you look at the slope of the dark matter density profile, has uh, quite a few features. Um, you know, essentially, uh, the, this edge of the dark matter halo is a strong function of how quickly the halo is growing. So if your halo is accreting very quickly, accreting mass very quickly, at every apocenter, you can't go as far out. Um, so it shrinks as a function of accretion rate. Uh, it also uh, changes as a function of at the, the over density with respect to say R200 changes also as a function of our redshift. Yes. So, uh, so at least from the India direction perspective, I, mean, mm -hmm. I always sort of use R200 as the cutoff, right? When I do mm -hmm. the J factor. So this flashback radius is very close to the R200, right? Yes, it is close to the R200, yes. Okay. But in principle, you could have it could be smaller than the R200, depending on uh, the accretion rate of the halo. It could also spread out much larger. Yeah. Thanks. But the matter density there is falling off. It's it's quite small. So, but yeah, essentially, it yeah, we realize these are small effects. But I'm just yeah. curious. Where, where do I cut off the line of sight integer? Yeah. 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 The delta at which flashback happens. Yeah, actually we looked at how delta evolves with different dark matter densities and where we expect that apocenter to happen. Like, you know, just like we do a, a spherical collapse calculation, you can yeah. do a calculation to get a, where the apocenter is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, uh, so I should say that you know while we, we were talking about dark matter particles so far, uh, these effects uh, happen in should happen in all collisionless components of the dark matter halo, uh, right? So you should see these also in the subhalos. Also, uh, you know you should see such features uh, in the subhalo distribution. Uh, of course, there are some subtle differences. Uh, the massive subhalos uh, subhalos are not point particles. They're they they have some uh, physical extent, they're prone to tidal uh, disruption, they're also uh, experience dynamical friction, uh, and so that essentially shifts uh, the, the um, splashback radius in, in sort of a predictable way with respect to where the particle splashback radius uh, shown here in black is shown. And of course, you know, you can see not only in this region, uh, but all throughout the halo's density profile, uh, you can see uh, features uh, that are different between sort of the galaxy distribution, the particle distribution, uh, and you can try to extract information about the history of this. So a lot of uh, work has, uh, a lot of really nice work uh, has been put into this, uh, particularly in simulations, to really characterize, uh, you know, I'm giving you a spher spherical description of uh, the evolution, to really characterize uh, where that edge is, um, Essentially, we know that halos are not, uh, individual halos are not uh, spheres, right? Uh, and we can really, it's, and the splashback radius is really a splashback uh, surface in some sense. And um, uh, Mansfield et al., Deemer et al. Have, have looked at, you know, very nice ways of really uh, mapping out that surface in, in sim at least in simulations where we can, you know, get a sense of what's uh, happening on an individual halo to halo basis. And there's been some really nice work by Demer at all showing that you know using these masses we can get really uh, sort of uh, uh, universal mass functions and so on. So uh, one of the things uh, you know I always like to sort of write this down why this may be of interest at all. Uh, so of course it found gives us a dynamical boundary for the halo. It gives us a physical definition for what we can call the orbiting or the realism uh, or the orbiting mass in the halo. Probes the growth history of the halo. It's also a fundamental length scale. It's a, it's a feature in the dark matter distribution. So it's uh, really, if you have dark matter, you should have uh, such a feature at the edge of the dark matter distribution. Uh, it's also sort of simple to understand uh, because it's made by the most recently accreted. That region is essentially comprised of the most recently accreted material that has not yet uh, completely phase mixed into the halo. And, uh, you know, it can be understood by easy gravitational collapse in an expanding universe. And uh, one of the things that I find really nice is that it is accessible actually observationally, and you can go out 
and look for it and see what are the things that we can learn from it essentially. Okay, so uh, another thing I wanted to point out that there are you know other features also inside the dark matter halo essentially. This is a stack profile of dark matter halos that are very slowly accreting. And in these cases, not only do you see an outer phase phase discontinuity, sometimes you can see a separation of the outer stream from the inner region of, uh, of the halo, you know, essentially sort of corresponding to the edge of the second caustic. So oftentimes we see that there's actually, uh, for a large fraction of halos, there's a second, uh, you know, second discontinuity, I shouldn't quite call it a caustic, but it's a second discontinuity, which we can also follow up and uh, try to, uh, try to uh, look for in, in observation. So the halo is essentially a very dynamical, uh, system, particularly the massive cluster mass halos that are uh, fa fairly young. Uh, so one of the things that we had been working on, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, Louisa Lucy Smith, who is now uh, uh, who is now at a postdoc at Max Planck, and she were uh, we were essentially what we were doing is we were taking for cluster halos, we were looking at the um, we were trying to correlate the accretion histories, like how the halo grows with mass. Uh, the mass of the halo as a function of time uh, with the present day mass profile uh, and the initial conditions. So we were trying to, uh, trying to see how the ICs and the mass accretion histories and the final profiles are related to each other. And she was, uh, she's an expert on machine learning. So she was sort of uh, looking for uh, features of the, mass, uh, particularly the mass accretion history uh, that, uh, that essentially uh, influenced the final profile of the halo. And one of the things we found uh, is that essentially the, there are three time scales. Uh, so these are for different radii inside the halo. And we found that there are within the halo, within these cluster mass objects, there are three distinct time scales uh, that stand out very clearly from each other, right? So something at around, so these, uh, these are all clusters at A of one, that is today. And, um, We've given it, you know, fed it the mass accretion history as a function of uh, A. And we see that there are at every radius, there's an inner uh, time scale at about A of 0.6 uh, and, and, and another time scale at about A of 0.85 and another time scale of A at close to today. And these time scales essentially distinctly uh, influence uh, the, the dark matter profile, right? And what we saw is that these time scales essentially are. Uh, do correspond to, you know, when we thought about what this time, these time scales are telling us, are essentially just, you know, uh, telling us uh, about the dynamical structure of the halo, right? So there is an inner sort of virilized mass that has fallen into the halo for a long time. Uh, we can think of it as the phase mists part of the halo. Then there is a, there is a recently falling a, a material, which is, uh, which essentially corresponds to uh, the dynamical time. So that A of, 0.85 corresponds exactly to the dynamical times of these halos. So that's being created by this material that is, you know, just in falling for the first time. And there is uh, also oftentimes, uh, particularly for clusters, uh, a very recently falling mergers that are creating this other peak at, at uh, the latest times. And actually, even if you did not use machine learning, and if you just took a dark matter halo, took all of its particles and just asked, when did they fall in? Let me just plot up the distribution at every radius of when these particles fail, fall in, you'll essentially see that you see these three time scales, right? So you see three separate time scales that are, uh, that are clearly distinguished inside of uh, the dark matter halo. So uh, there's, a, there's a part made up of old particles that is quite distinct uh, from things that are uh, near, you know, at their dynamical time scales and things that are just recently falling in. So essentially the, you know, we have uh, the, the velocity, the energetics of the cluster halo essentially is not completely relaxed. And there's actually quite a significant amount of material uh, which is uh, currently falling in and it actually forms quite a significant amount of mass in these, uh, in these massive systems. Um, yes, how much time do I have? Five minutes, but I'll give you more time, don't worry. No, I'm, no. I, I'm the I'm the culprit. Uh, suppose I have, uh, I mean, dark matter baryon scattering in this thing, right? So that mm -hmm. will heat up the dark matter. That may change the splashback radius. Is that correct or no? Dark matter. Um, uh, yes. If your if your dark matter particles are going 
you know, have very radial orbits and they're going down to the galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, they will basically lose energy at the peri-center. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so, okay, in the final five, 10 minutes of the talk, I will quickly go over the observations of galaxy clusters uh, and what we learned from them. So we've heard over the past few days that there are a variety of ways of uh, observing the halo, right? Observing and weighing the dark matter. Um, so I uh, work, have worked a lot with the Dark Energy Survey and uh, we essentially, you know, if you're nearby, you can measure actually redshifts of galaxies and their dynamics and even map out the line of sight velocity distribution. Um, when you go out to higher redshifts, you have a larger volume, but you don't have redshifts all the time. So these are in photometric surveys. Uh, how do we measure the galaxy distribution? Um, so one way is just by tracing the uh, dark matter potential with the galaxies uh, of a cluster. So we measure the galaxy number density or we measure weak lensing, right? So we measure the lensing of uh, the small distortions from lensing of galaxies that are behind the cluster. Uh, so, uh, Right, so the first uh, observ observations directed at measuring these uh, splashback halo edges was actually done with optical clusters by Moore et al. Um, and uh, using optical red mapper clusters, this work was followed up in DES. And uh, there's quite a bit of story over there where we, where firstly we detected this, uh, you know, we, we detected uh, in the galaxy distribution uh, particularly a uh, sharp edge, uh, this uh, minimum feature, which uh, was consistent with having a splashback like feature, uh, but it was uh, a 20% offset from what we expected from theory. And over time, we've uh, realized that these are, there are systematic errors with these optical clusters. Uh, so we've moved on to using uh, SZ signal for now, until we sort that out. And uh, essentially using SZ selected clusters, uh, we uh, measured using the SPT survey, and also Zurker and Moore measured using the Planck uh, clusters and HSC galaxies, uh, the splashback radius for these objects. Um, and actually in, in, in case of these SE selected clusters, uh, they match up quite, there's no at least statistical inconsistency uh, with Lambda CDM simulations. Um, right, so, uh, so originally we had about 300 SPT clusters, but uh, now in the DS survey, we. Uh, cross-correlating with the DS galaxies with uh, the ACT cluster surveys, we have about a, a sample of about 1,000 clusters. Uh, so not only can we measure the galaxy distribution of these clusters, uh, we can also go ahead and uh, use them for measuring lensing. So you know, we can directly measure the dark matter distribution using lensing. And um, recent work by, by you know, Tae Hyun Shin, uh, we measured the uh, dark matter profile from you know, 0.1 megaparsec to around 10 megaparsec, both in galaxies and lensing. And um, we looked at this uh, logarithmic slope profile. It's, it's consistent with lambda CDM. And I really found it nice to see that how, you know, directly from observations, we see that the galaxies and the dark matter, at least for the galaxies that we are sampling, follow each other quite, quite beautifully. Um, and um, Right, so we are really measuring the entire profile of, of uh, the, the uh, dark matter distribution over wide range of scales in these cluster environments. Um, so uh, given that now we have uh, quite good data to measure these profiles very uh, precisely, particularly in galaxies, um, one of the things that we have tried, so one thing in which galaxies are different from dark matter particles is that they're not, uh, they're not identical in time. So they evolve in time. Um, so essentially, uh, we, uh, as, uh, you know, we, we looked at galaxies of different colors and tried to see how their uh, distribution within these clusters uh, changed. And what we essentially found is that uh, they look quite uh, significantly different from each other. So the red galaxies, uh, which we think, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the red galaxies have a, a very sharp feature in their profile, um, uh, whereas green and blue galaxies don't show a sharper feature. And also the location of the minimum actually shifts as a function of, of the galaxy color. So one way of explaining what we are seeing, one model of thinking about this um, could be that essentially we, are, we can use these, uh, the, the fact that the galaxies are evolving and if they are evolving due to the cluster environment, um, due to their orbital motion, due to 
quenching in the cluster environment, we can use uh, use you, you know use their colors as, as in a sense as a clock, right? We can use this flashback feature as a clock inside the structure to really uh, trace out what is happening to them. So if a blue galaxy falls in, um, it eventually gets and it eventually gets quenched uh, before pericenter. It won't show any flashback like feature because there's no transition from multi-streaming. Whereas if it uh, goes out to uh, you know sort of here, then we have the the transition, the phase phase discontinuity shifts to an inner region where here we are moving from the two stream to the single stream region. So we use this simple uh, model uh, and also tested where particles that have been accreted at different times lie in the phase space of dark matter halo and show that, you know, that essentially shifts uh, this location of the slope minimum and use uh, this relatively simplistic model to sort of estimate how long these objects have been inside the halo. And we also used it to sort of uh, estimate a, a, a quenching time, right? Um, so the flashback gives us a very simple way of really uh, model independent way of telling us how long things have been inside the halo. But for quenching, we can, you know, we, there's no reason to stick to flashback, right? We can use the entire galaxy profile that we are measuring quite precisely uh, to get, uh, get the chemistry. Uh, I should say that uh, with, you know, two real nice undergrads, uh, at the time I was a postdoc, Tara and Matt, uh, they looked at hydro simulations. And when we looked at hydro simulations, they looked very different from what is happening uh, with our data. And uh, there are some curious differences uh, which we, we want to track down, particularly our uh, very simplistic model does not take into account you know, angular momentum of orbits. And I think a lot of that will be solved when we take that into account. Uh, but yeah, so you know, this is a demonstration of <clears throat> you know, how, uh, how we can add in our, our simple intuition about uh, the halo phase space uh, to sort of uh, extract information from the density profile, which is really just, you know, in, in a sense, sort of uh, telling us about the time evolution. Of it. Okay, I'll take two minutes. I wanted to, <coughs> just because this is a dark matter uh, workshop, I wanted to talk about this uh, a little bit. So one of the things we're measuring the profiles really well, right? Um, so down to pretty low radius. And uh, we've been working uh, with Orco, uh, Ethan, and others on self-interacting dark matter simulations. And we all know that they, you know, we all know that these the, about the core cast problem uh, and that the structure of halos can be significantly different. The shapes can be different and so on. Uh, the phase space of halos can also be quite different if you look at it. Um, and actually there are effects, uh, turns out, all throughout the halo when you have these uh, scattering. Um, so this is the usual core cusp uh, of CDM versus SIDM. Uh, this is the velocity distribution, the RMS velocity distribution in CDM. And whereas, you know, we get this uh, thermalization in SIDM. Uh, and uh, what we notice is uh, essentially, uh, you know, apart from this huge core, which is really a dramatic effect, we also get a steepening of the profile in the outskirts. And uh, particularly for clusters, the outskirts are cleaner because you don't have this massive galaxy sitting over there. And you can actually, uh, given current weak lensing surveys, you can try to measure this uh, steepening of the profile in the outskirts. Uh, so this is uh, just the lensing signal estimated from a simulation and the lensing signal from uh, SIDM models. And you can look how, how we essentially given, so the sh uh, light shaded band was DS year three, uh, and the gray is LSST, and you can really start to distinguish uh, even in this in the outer regions of clusters between uh, these models. And you can see that dark matter models change the profile in a significantly different way than you know dark matter different halo concentration uh, models of of, of the halo. Uh, so with Yuming Zhang, we are also working on dissipative dark matter models uh, of self interaction where. Uh, the scattering is not completely elastic. You have some inelastic scattering as well. And there, of course, you know, you have a core collapse, uh, things condense to the center. And that also has uh, significant differences in the slope profile in the outer regions of halos. Um, and we're trying to constrain it uh, given the current uh, DES uh, measurement. Uh, it's interesting that currently even this, it, it seems like the DES measurements, even when we take hydro into account, are kind of steeper than what we expect uh, from uh, even for CDM uh, with Baryon. Uh, so there's a mystery to be sorted out over there. It's of course currently not a very significant result, but these will get uh, pretty precise in the coming years. 
Uh, right. So I think I'll leave the summary up. Uh, I think uh, my purpose was to sort of convince you that looking at the struct internal structure, there's a lot of, we think of the halo as a significantly dynamical system. Even observationally, we can sort of try to map it uh, to our physical picture and try to uh, think of it in new ways to extract information about it. All right. Uh, thank you. I'll stop here. And sorry about this. Uh, super nice talk. Could you um, just explain a little bit of what the observational bias was that in the DES clusters led to, you know, a very different result than your SC selected cluster? Yes, I think, yeah, I can uh, give a review of what the observation, I don't think we have completely resolved it, actually. Um, so one of the issues is uh, when we pick optical clusters, firstly, we are picking them based on the galaxies themselves. So we put down an aperture and count up galaxies out to some radius. And then we are trying to find a cutoff in the distribution of the galaxies, right? Uh, so that there is some circularity in that argument, but we also see it in lensing actually when we don't do it in the distribution of galaxies. So one of the issues with red mapper clusters are these projection issues where we have, uh, where the mass lambda relation, the mass, uh, halo mass and tracer relation uh, uh, is, is uh, messed up because we have structure getting projected from behind the cluster because we're ju just picking up over densities of red galaxy and there are red, there might be other red galaxies in the line of sight. Um, so that again, uh, essentially, we're not tracking it back to the right mass. So we've checked that if we didn't do a lambda selection, but an abundance matching selection, we actually get a better agreement with uh, lambda CDS. But it's very difficult to mock up uh, red mapper clusters because you know so much galaxy physics there. And I think that's still a work in progress to really sit down and pin it out. Um, these experiments which look for gamma rays from annihilating dark matter, mm -hmm. uh, if they can resolve the angle, of the galaxy, they should see a dip and then an upturn again because of the splashback. Yeah, they should. Yeah, but I think, but it's very low in the outskirts. So, Mister wanted to understand one thing. So, uh, this splashback radius is it kind of a new definition for the, you know, extent or radial extent for a halo? Yes, it's it's a new definition. Okay. So, yeah. if so, like, uh, why do we suddenly need this, or how is it more advantageous than the you know R two hundred, or that just I mean just to get an understanding. I mean. Yeah, I, I so it's not it's really depends on what is the question that you are asking, right? For many purposes, it's totally fine to use R two hundred, uh, you know, as the uh, halo radius definition, uh, you know, if you're it's, it's also fine to use R500 as the halo radius. It's, it's really the question of what is it that you're asking. Uh, it's important to keep in mind what it is that you're getting out of it. If you take R200 and then you uh, trip over sort of, because you've made a definition, you've made a choice. And then, you know, oftentimes what happens is we, uh, we get confused. We, for example, we say what is in a halo versus what is outside a halo based on this R200, right? But for example, satellites can extend outside of R200, right? Um, so you know, we, we tag them as central halos and then we get confused about the clustering and we call that halo exclusion effect and so on. But I think it's, it's really, as long as we have a clear picture of what it is that we are defining, it's totally fine also to use R200. Uh, this is giving us a physical boundary of what that phase space surface is. And you know, we can think of, there are many ways you can use that, uh, thinking about what it is that you exactly want to do. Uh, there's also no harm in using R100, you know, essentially that's, very, that's a very clean measurement of the peak density inside some region, right? Uh, you don't even have to stick to inside the halo. So it, it's just, it's giving you a definition of where the edge of the multi-streaming region is, and it's, it's really about what question you're asking. So uh, I had a doubt in the uh, image versus time graph that you showed. So the third peak is almost always uh, near or at the scale factor of one, right? Yeah. So 
I do not understand why most of the mergers should happen during the present day or no, it's not that most of the mer yeah, so yeah, good, good. So what happens? Uh, so one is uh, mergers. Uh, so the sub halos don't survive very long inside the halo, they get slowly, they get tidally disrupted and, you know, particularly their, their core survive, but they, they don't form a large part of the mass anymore. So during the first infall, when they have actually not crossed the pericenter, uh, the subhalo is in a sense still uh, a large part, large clump that is falling in. Eventually it just gets uh, disrupted and phase mixed. Uh, so that is why in the first, you know, first uh, giga year or so, it's really, uh, it forms a large part of the, you, 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 it tends to stand out in the distribution, right? So uh, that's, there's also stuff like dynamical friction that pulls it towards the center and disrupts it eventually. So that is why you, the, and also we see it in the part that is really very recent, very close to one, because there the, the, multi, the virialized dark matter density has also fallen. So if you have a large clump falling in along with that, that actually forms a large part of the mass, which is why it always uh, stands out near the time when it's just about falling in into the cluster. Okay, we so can talk more about okay, that. Okay. The last question. Okay, I have like two small questions. So this flashback radius is connected to the phase phase, which you were Yes, addressing. yeah. Now people, um, before we started doing flashback radius have used this, for example, Margaret Geller mm -hmm. have basically looked at defined halos by looking at phase phase. Yeah. The, I, yeah, Geller okay. and Reins and all this stuff. Yeah. So I mean, the, the, you know, the cell similar solution, people have looked at the phase phase for, for a long do, time. Do, do you know how, their sizes or whatever compares with the splash. I mean, they were doing it, they were looking at, they were, the resolutions were worse at this time. So they were looking at velocities and they were basically doing these beautiful caustics with where they had this uh, velocities uh, and, and they could basically identify galaxies which will be within those uh, whatever uh, lines the and then- Caustic yeah. method is slightly different. They were looking at the line of sight projected yeah. phase space. Um, it, it tracks the escape velocity uh, as a function of radius as, uh, you know, and in a, yeah. in a model that you assume, say, NFW or something. So it does yeah. not actually necessarily always align with the actual splashback radius. But I have actually seen other work for individual clusters where people have uh, tried to find apocenters, right, rather than, uh, rather than this caustic matter. So the caustic edge is slightly different uh, from where the this flashback edge is. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is that, I mean, the clusters are formed and there are shocks, right? Yes, uh, yeah. These shocks, uh, are they outside the splashback radius, at the splashback radius? Yeah, that's a great question. And I didn't have time to go over that. So a um, lot of uh, people have been looking at this both in simulations and actually even in data now. Uh, you know, Daisuke Nagai's group. Uh, so they uh, had this, uh, uh, they pointed out that in simulations particularly, uh, the gas spreads out pretty far out of the halo, almost twice the splashback radius. Yes. And you don't see that in like birching like solutions and so on. Right? So it's a, it's not clear why that happens in hydro simulations. Uh, it's not completely clear. Um, so it can, it seems like in sims at least it can go out to pretty large radius. In data, uh, uh, there's a Chicago group uh, they, they, who are actually looking at SZ yes, to yes. see uh, this, uh, this kind of a cutoff at the edge. And there, it, so far what we've seen is that there is actually, uh, it's quite uh, noisy, right? not noisy, it's not a very high signal to noise measurement yet, but it's consistent with what we're getting in the matter for now. Uh, I can show you the okay. Results. Okay. First of all, let's thank all the speakers again for the very nice talks.